If you want to watch queer movies, you have to actually be able to see them. So thanks to GlassesUSA.com for sponsoring this video. I've left a link in the description for up to 65% off your first pair, like these ones. I also just wanted to show you all something that I am very, very excited about, and it is the fact I have an actual copy of my book in person, in real life. It is called Hearing Queer. I am so proud of it. It has these beautiful illustrations. It is joyful, educational, all in one. It's gonna be released on the 3rd of May. Everyone who pre-orders the book can get themselves a signed book plate. I will leave info in the description if you would like to do that. It has these beautiful illustrations by Jackie Sheridan. You can see like the front cover, the back was done by her, and there's lots of illustrations inside. I don't know if I'm, I don't know if I'm allowed to show you, what the hell? Ooh, there we go. Beautiful. Okay, okay, let's get on with the list. So when I first started working on this video, none of these movies were out yet. Some of them are now because it is in fact March when I'm recording this and it might even be April when it comes out. Oops. But that just means that instead of you being able to like make a watch list for the future, some of these will be a watch right now kind of movie instead, which... I kind of feel like it's a win-win situation. I did a companion video to this one already on my channel about LGBTQ plus TV series coming up this year. Um, I've actually watched a couple of them now and already a standout for me from that list is This Is Going To Hurt, which was a powerful comedy drama about a gay junior doctor in the NHS starring Ben Whishaw. I recommend giving that video a watch for some full series to dig your teeth into, but if you want just like one-off watches, then this video is the one for you. This this list has over 30 movies in it, I think, but isn't in any particular order. So I'm gonna cover genres all the way from like wartime romance to creepy horror. So there will be something for everyone. Without further ado, let's get into it. The Novice. There's something about obsessive, competitive female narratives that just seems to scream queer. Whether it's Black Swan or The Perfection, the all-encompassing passion for their chosen profession also seems to extend to an all-encompassing passion for hot people. The Novice is a new movie about a university rower, played by Isabel Furman of the creepy The Orphan fame, who is willing to go to great lengths to be the best on her team, no matter the cost. It's gained massive critical success, currently at 95% on Rotten Tomatoes, and gathering award nominations at seemingly every festival it shows at. It's set to be shown at Flair, the LGBTQ plus film festival run by the British Film Institute that I will definitely be attending. So I am very excited to watch this film myself later this month. It's been praised for its tense score, psychological horror tone and visionary directing from Lauren Hadaway, who has only ever directed one short film before this one. Definitely seems like a queer film and queer filmmaker to watch. Catch the Fair One. Catch the Fair One is a taut and violent thriller about a down and out boxer Kaylee who is searching for her missing younger sister. Kaylee herself is in dire straits after an injury ended her career and financial hardship means that she's living in a shelter and is stealing food from her diner job to survive. She's also a recovering addict which has put a strain on her relationship with her mother. Kaylee is convinced that her sister was kidnapped by traffickers and sets out to rescue her, taking the law into her own hands after the police response didn't care enough about a missing native American girl. Her drive is relentless and her methods are sometimes brutal, in the same way as the white male characters who are so often at the center of thrillers around recovering missing daughters or wives. Reviews of this movie have praised it for its unexpected twists and turns and the way it weaves through themes of racial and economic inequalities from a Native American perspective. I want to dance with somebody. Whitney Houston is getting the Bohemian Rhapsody treatment this year as the writer of the Queen biopic turns to the late singer's rise to stardom. This isn't out until late this year, but the info that we have at the moment confirms it to be a musical drama that will provide a joyous, emotional, and heartbreaking celebration of her life. The film producers have said, while being very frank about the price that superstardom exacted, it will be both the rich and complex saga of the search for the perfect marriage between song and singer and audience, and at the same time the moving tale of a simple Jersey girl trying to find her way back home. It's also reportedly not going to shy away from her relationship with Robin Crawford. Although there were rumors about this relationship with her best friend and executive assistant while she was still alive, they were never confirmed until after Houston's death in Crawford's memoir. But I know that a lot of people feel that to represent the totality of her as a person, this is a relationship that a biopic can't ignore. We're sure to get more information as this year goes on because this isn't due to drop until like Christmas time of 2022. So I know that a lot of people out there who are big fans of Whitney Houston will be waiting to see like what other information we can glean before its release. Dope Queens. 
For those interested in seeing more trans talent grace our screens, they'll be excited for what is being described as an indie romantic thriller, which is also semi-autobiographical. Very intriguing. Dope Queen stars Alexandra Gray and Trace Lysette, and we'll see them play two friends trapped in a prison of their own making. Even more intriguing. It's going to be set in San Francisco's Tenderloin District, known as the world's first legally recognized trans district. So the casting of the movie is clearly not meant to be incidental, but a key part of the narrative. I couldn't find anyone talking about this, but I think this is based on a play of the same name. Reviews of that original work praise the script for scratching away at any stereotypes or cliches that such a premise might conjure, and instead allowing the three central characters to have real depth. And a complicated love triangle, of course. Queens of the Qing Dynasty. So this movie gives us one of the first explicitly genderqueer characters, played by a genderqueer actor, that I can think of in a dramatic role in a feature film. The aforementioned character Anne is a volunteer at a hospital where our other lead, troubled teen star, has recently been admitted after attempting to end her life. This trope of mismatched friendship and bonding while institutionalized is one we've seen a few times before, but this queer take on the micro genre has the potential to add more layers. Fun bit of trivia, um, the actress who is playing Star is an unknown who kept in touch with the director after auditioning for their previous movie and not being cast, and the story of the film is said to be in part inspired by their own life. Early reviews of the movie are quick to point out it is a slow burn of a narrative. Jared Mobarak of the film stage writing, be prepared that the words swift or kinetic aren't descriptors I'd use. It's purely about the characters as well as the place, but also praise the joint queerness of the leads and the way that even with that setup, it doesn't descend into like, queer misery and melodrama. In a standout review, critic Steven Saito wrote, Mackenzie certainly has an aesthetically distinctive vision as a filmmaker, but what shouldn't be so unique yet is remains her rare ability to neither look down on her characters or make them subjects of pity when working their way out of dire straits, following Star and Anne into their private spaces without ever feeling as if she's encroaching and allowing even those with the smallest bit parts far bigger lives off screen than the glimpse you get will afford. Which, I mean, sounds like an incredible watch. Beauty. The only information we have about this upcoming drama written by Lena Waithe is what we can glean from various one sentence summaries across the internet that are all slightly different. So here's what we know. It follows an up and coming singer in 1980s New Jersey. She's offered a lucrative recording contract and is on the precipice of becoming a worldwide star. All seems great, right? Worldwide stardom, fame, money, a romance with her butch bestie, Incredible. Except all isn't what it's cracked up to be. With mounting pressure from the industry, a domineering family, and what her love for her girlfriend might mean with her new life. Flee. So I'm recording this video after the Oscar nominations have been released, but before the winners have been announced. Uh, so I know that the next two movies are nominated and are actually kind of front runners in their respective categories. The first is Flea, an experimental animated documentary. The film is focused on an Afghan refugee as he looks back at his secret past, fleeing from his home to start his life in Denmark as a child, where he is now about to marry his soon to be husband. And when I say secret past, I don't mean that in like a catchy like ambiguous movie summary way early reviews of the movie make it clear that this is a story that our central figure has genuinely never told anyone before it's intimate and intense and made even more so by the fact that he's telling his story to the filmmaker himself who is also his real life best friend the choice to animate the documentary is quite honestly a brilliant one allowing for a level of anonymity and also giving us access to the varied events locations and landscapes that the tale covers without the lack of first-hand footage at the time being a constraint the secret past is also interspersed with current personal struggles brought on by the guilt and trauma of his childhood with one reviewer remarking, in their highest form, documentaries can reveal humanity far more effectively than the written script ever could. Flea hits all those notes and then some. The Power of the Dog. The other Oscar contender here is, of course, The Power of the Dog, a movie Jazza and I have now covered on the Queer Movie Podcast. It's a movie neither of us were super keen on during our first viewing, but Jazza has since rewatched and enjoyed it a lot more. If you're into sort of slow creeping stories that span years rather than days, 
boasting stunning settings, visuals, and taut moments of pathos, this might be up your alley. Like I didn't personally enjoy it, but it's not because it's a bad movie. It's just not my kind of thing. The movie focuses on the story of two brothers. One is cruel and harsh and the other is kind and nervous, but both of them from a rich family background who upturn the lives of a widow and her son. The son is sensitive and timid at first, code for gay, along with the other characters he is tormented by Benedict Cumberbatch's cruel lead, but they slowly start to develop like a interesting, tense friendship that's going to essentially change all of their lives. So alongside an ambiguous ending and pacing that kind of swings between very, very fast and very, very slow, it's not going to be for everyone, but those who love it seem to really love it. Lightyear. Okay, so this is a fun midway bonus movie for this video. I don't think it belongs on this list properly, but I had to include it, if only for the bitter irony. It's recently come out in Pixar staff's open letter to Disney execs protesting the lack of action on the Florida Don't Say Gay bill that um, executives have actively censored attempts at LGBTQ plus representation in the past. This was something that we all kind of knew, but we didn't officially know until now, so it was kind of a big deal. So when we heard that Lightyear, the Buzz Lightyear origin story movie inspired by everyone's favorite Toy Story Spaceman was going to have substantial LGBT representation, we were surprised, but not exactly hopeful. We've had empty promises from Disney before. In fact, I've made like whole videos about it. So I feel like most of us are waiting for this to be like a tiny moment, like a photo in the background on the desk of a side character, like something that can be edited out, um, but maybe they will surprise us and have like an actual LGBTQ plus lead that kids who are watching can understand and pick up on. Probably not though. Although it would gain another entry into the Disney first gay character Olympics. Um, so I guess that's something. So I just wanted to take a minute here to talk about today's sponsor, GlassesUSA.com, which is where I got these glasses and a few more that I'm going to be showing off in just a second. A pair of glasses on their site, including frames and lenses, start at just $30, and basic prescription lenses are free and included with any frames on the site. In fact, you can add any type of prescription to almost any pair of frames, including sunglasses. Prescription sunglasses, believe me, are a game changer. There are over 6,000 styles to choose from on the site, including both their in-house designs like Muse and Amelia E, as well as designer brands like Ray-Ban and Oakley. These include kids' glasses, sports glasses, safety glasses, honestly, uh, more types of glasses than I even knew existed. So we have these thin kind of gold frames. These are quickly becoming my like go-to daily glasses. And then we have these sort of studious dark academia tortoiseshell frames. And then these black rimmed cat eye glasses that I personally think go very well with the only kind of eyeliner that I know how to do. And finally, we have my more wild card choice. They're a lot chunkier than normal, but I kind of felt like the powder pink powder blue goes with a lot of the clothes that I wear and goes very nicely with my hair. I mean, not to expose myself as a little clumsy baby that I am, but a special thanks to Glasses USA for coming into my life at this particular moment, because I fully stepped on both of my old pairs of glasses and broke them beyond repair. So these were much needed. So when I was picking my frames, I used both the virtual mirror option, as well as the info about like size dimensions of the frames to figure out which ones would suit me best, like how they would fit my face, because you know, they would let me see how they would look like on my face without having to try them one in a store. And for those of us that spend, um, some might argue, too much time in front of our computers and phones, they also offer blue light blocking lenses for any glasses on the site, which help protect your eyes from digital blue light and avoid eye strain and discomfort. You can add blue light blocking lenses as part of your prescription, but you can also get those lenses in glasses without a prescription as well. So check out the link in the description for 65% off your first pair. I've also included links specifically to the glasses frames that I wore in this video if you like these styles in particular. Benediction. I've made no secret of the fact that I prefer my queer movies to have happy endings, but occasionally I can deal with a bit of angst. A few nights ago, for example, I read a fan fiction that made me sob uncontrollably at 3 a.m., and I would do it again. This biopic about the war poet Siegfried Sassoon is going to absolutely destroy me. Sassoon is a figure that I have long been fascinated by. He's a soldier who won the military cross for gallantry before turning on the entire concept of warfare in visceral and heart-wrenching poetry, carted off to a psychiatric hospital for shell shock, and mentoring the arguably better known poet of the era, Wilfred Owen. After the war, all that passion and talent faded somewhat into obscurity. 
And I know from my own knowledge of his life that I'm not expecting a triumphant and uplifting like return ending for his character. Early reviews and blurbs of the movie confirm it deals extensively with his sexuality and relationships, as well as his openly anti-war sentiment. One reviewer was particularly blunt about the tone of the film, saying, The tragic life of the poet and soldier is revisited with melancholy and theatricality in a bleak and often hard-to-watch biopic. For personal reasons related to my entire English literature class at school being convinced that Wilfred Owen and Siegfried Sassoon had a romantic relationship at Craig Lockhart Hospital, I am particularly excited about the fact that Wilfred Owen is listed on IMDb as a character in this movie. But from the reaction to the film so far, I have a feeling it will lean more towards the almost mythologized tragedy of Owen's death and Sassoon's potential grief that follows than dwelling on the relationship between them in any particular detail. But I mean, if anyone did feel the need to make a movie about like gay pacifist poets sharing their craft and their hearts together in, in a hospital while recovering from shell shock, like I wouldn't say no, you know what I mean? Girl picture. So Girl Picture premiered at Sundance and is one of the festival highlights at Flair this month. For those of you who don't know, I co-host a podcast called The Queer Movie Podcast with my friend Jazza and um, we both got press accreditation to the festival. Very fancy. It basically means we get to see like digital screeners and maybe interview some of the filmmakers. So we're going to try and do a, like a Flair special episode. We're not sure exactly what it's going to look like, but I have a feeling we're probably going to be talking about some of these movies in that episode too. Anyway, all that to say, Girl Picture is a Finnish coming of age film about three young women discovering first love, sex, and pleasure as they experience life at the cusp of adulthood. Two of our leads work together at a smoothie shop, because why not? Uh, one of them is looking for like instant attraction while her friend scoffs at the idea of that kind of like instant attraction love at first sight. However, she soon feels sparks fly with our third lead, a skater girl who comes into the shop one day. The story plays out over three weeks of all-consuming first love romance as the girls are swept up in the complexities of trust and intimacy. Critics have praised the fresh feeling of the movie, allowing the leads to be messy and unlikable and handling the themes with maturity and thoughtful depth. This definitely feels like more of a coming of age drama than a classic teen movie, so I will be very interested to see the reaction not just from adult critics but also from teenagers who are reflecting on the experiences of these characters in their own lives too. The History of Sound Described as a World War I romance, this queer period piece is based on an award-winning short story, as a lot of good movies seem to be. The official description of the movie is, In this snatched, short-lived moment in their young lives, and while discovering the epic sweep of the US, both men are deeply changed. Which, um, is kind of vague and could pretty much mean anything. I'm hoping that this, like, short-lived, um, it's not as bleak as it sounds. I found some other articles and pages with a little bit more information about like what on earth that official summary meant. Um, so these men essentially are traveling around and recording the testimonies, the music, the like interviews, I think, with various people who are involved in American folk music, basically bonding over this experience and the history of music and sound. One of the producers has said of the story, it beautifully combines the epic and intimate minutiae of life, capturing the freedom and truth of human instinct and its conflict with expectation. The history of sound gives us so much to experience and take home. And Josh O'Connor, known for his previous queer role in the beautiful movie God's Own Country, is set to star, which I know a lot of people will be very excited about including myself. Mars One. This was another Sundance premiere. So this movie follows the lives of a lower middle-class black family in Brazil following the election of a fictional right-wing president dictator who represents everything that they are not. The family is characterized as optimists who are trying to quietly live their lives after the election results, but are feeling increasingly helpless as the new political reality emerges. The characters include the family's queer daughter, who is falling in love with another woman and wonders if it's time to leave home. The story has been described as tender and uplifting, bringing together an interconnected web of family with humor and affection. I know a lot of audiences like a bit of family drama and tension, but sometimes having a family that supports each other can also be nice. Potato Dreams of America 
The title of this movie is just as wild as its premise, to be honest, which is apparently based on a true story. It's a dark comedy telling the story of a gay boy who moves to America from Russia after his mother becomes a mail order bride for an eccentric older man in the States. Because, you know, why not? The movie balances both humour and heart in its tale of 1980s USSR USA culture clash as our lead grows up and comes into his own identity. Also, Jesus is a character in this movie. Like the boy's imaginary friend is literally Jesus Christ of dying on the cross fame and is played by Jonathan Bennett who played heartthrob Aaron Samuels in Mean Girls and is very gay himself in real life. Uh, we love to see it. Truly this movie seems like it's gonna be like the ultimate chaotic indie queer movie and I am very much here for that. Rustin. So I mentioned this movie in my video essay about activists on screen from a few weeks ago, particularly how exciting this portrayal of Bayard Rustin is set to be. The movie is being co-written and directed by the iconic George C. Wolfe and will tell the story of gay civil rights activist Rustin, who was a key organizer of the 1963 March on Washington. He continued his activist work throughout his life, including being a member of the Young Communist League and serving three years in federal prison for his anti-war actions and his open attitude to his sexuality led civil rights leaders to relegate him to roles outside of the public eye on many occasions. So it will be interesting to see how much of this complex history is included in the film itself. The movie's also being produced by Higher Ground Productions, which is founded by Barack and Michelle Obama and is part of the multi-production deal they have with Netflix. Just because of who's involved in the production, I wouldn't be surprised if this movie had a similar kind of tone to Selma and Milk in terms of being kind of of high production value, character study, very well received critically, potentially in contention for the Academy Awards, maybe? A lot of the movies on this list are like more quiet indie movies or like low budget, things like that, um, or just general dramas that don't necessarily have a lot of uh, traction to get picked up for awards. But looking at things like Selma and uh, Milk Beforehand that had these like very personal tales of activists who are we're alive um, just long enough ago that nobody is gonna feel threatened about the things that they were talking about. It feels like this maybe could be in that kind of arena, but I guess we gotta wait and find out. See you then. This character-driven drama follows two exes as they rekindle over a decade after their abrupt breakup. One has gone on to become an art professor with a less than satisfying life as a wife and mother. The other has transitioned and is still grappling with her identity to some degree. The director of this movie is trans herself and wrote the story based on aspects of her own life and worries and experiences. She wrote in the director's statement, See You Then centers around the universal truth that no matter how much we change, part of us will always remain the same. It's been described as a reasonably quiet, nearly two-hander of a movie, with the script focusing almost entirely on the two women and their intimate performances across the reunion. So if you're someone who likes this kind of quiet, intimate drama, this one might definitely be for you. I'm also noticing on this list, a lot of the like writers and directors being queer and trans themselves for a number of these movies, which I also think is very exciting. People getting to tell their own stories. Um, a lot of these people are putting autobiographical elements into it or elements of biography from other people. And I think that kind of authenticity or potential authenticity is really exciting. To Kill the Beast. This movie has been described in its film festival logline as a bold piece of tropical gothic that puts young female desire at the center of its loose narrative. Which sounds um, intense, but it's currently at 100% rated on Rotten Tomatoes, so I guess it works. We're entering into the world of queer mystery thrillers with this one. A 17 year old girl goes searching for her long lost brother while hoping to ease the strained relationships in her family. Staying in a small town hostel run by her aunt, she also becomes drawn to an older woman who is also staying there. Alongside this sexual awakening, there are also stories of a beast out killing people in the surrounding jungles during the night. It's believed that the beast is an evil human spirit taking the form of different animals, and it will take everything she has for our protagonist to fight this creeping evil and potentially find her brother too. Bros. 
Billy Eichner of Chaotic Billy on the Street Viral Fame has written and stars in this upcoming queer rom-com, which boasts an all-LGBTQ plus principal cast, including our favourite rom-com boy Luke McFarlane as Eichner's love interest. Okay, so I covered Luke McFarlane's Hallmark movie career on the Queer Movie Podcast when we talked about queer Christmas movies. We also talked about our hope that we would see him in more queer romantic lead roles, so... Big personal fan of this casting. It's being talked about as the first major studio film to feature an all LGBTQ plus principal cast playing both the queer and heterosexual roles, which is an exciting move with the amount of queer actors who have talked about the lack of roles offered after they came out, essentially proving both that they don't have to be pigeonholed into queer roles, but also that there are queer stories that need to be told that they can be cast in. Eigner himself has said, after queer actors have spent decades watching straight actors capitalise both artistically and professionally by playing LGBTQ plus characters, it is a long overdue dream come true to be able to assemble this remarkable, hilarious cast. Okay, so I was going to say here that it's being marketed as the first gay rom-com from a major studio, which didn't feel entirely true when I read it, so I looked into it and it definitely isn't. But Eichner tweeted much more specifically that he believes it to be the first romantic comedy about gay men ever pre- produced by a major studio, which may well be true. Probably we should add in the US to that because major studios outside of America won't have been taken into account there. I feel like it also maybe depends on your definition of rom-com because Love, Simon definitely got lauded with that title for a bit a few years ago. A lot of the previous films I immediately thought of were, I think, either about other queer identities rather than gay men or distributed by major studios rather than being produced by them. Like Sony did Saving Face, which is about queer women, um, but I'm a cheerleader was Lionsgate, Fire Island, which is on this list and is about gay men, is being distributed by Searchlight um, rather than produced by them. I'm glad it's been specified by Eichner himself, but I wish more write-ups about the movie were being as specific, not least because I feel like this is major disrespect to the BBC who produced Imagine Me and You, for example. But, you know, what can you do? In terms of plot, we don't actually have too much to go on. The film summary so far is two men with commitment problems attempt a relationship, which is pretty generic for right now, but a longer summary will no doubt drop soon. The movie is scheduled to be released this summer, which should make for a nice kind of fluffy, sunny pride watch. Fire Island. Okay, since I just mentioned it, Let's just talk about Fire Island now. Pride and Prejudice has approximately 1,003 adaptations, but I say, why not have one more? That's Fire Island. It is a modern queer take on Pride and Prejudice. Although interestingly, the summaries so far talk about the idea of like these two best friends who are on a group holiday to Fire Island. For those of you who are familiar with Pride and Prejudice, you will know that it's kind of like the ultimate enemies to lovers story, very much not friends to lovers. So not so much a setup of two friends falling for each other. So I'm very excited to see whether they're making any changes to the original, whether these two will get outside love interests or if there will be a fallout during the trip that makes them enemies or if they're gonna get together at all. Love in Colour. Love in Colour is being produced by shamefully straight queer icon Natasha Lyonne alongside Maya Rudolph. It tells the story of an aspiring teen artist who's forced to join her high school track team. She finds herself falling for a teammate but not the one that she initially expected. So this movie has gotten way more controversial since it was first announced. What was set to be a cute Hulu coming of age romance between two teen girls, played by real life queer actors Aulii Carvalho and Rowan Blanchard, has been overshadowed by a TikTok uploaded by Carvalho calling Blanchard biphobic. The video, which is now unavailable, was a stitch in response to a fan talking about being excited for the new movie. No info was given in the video about what prompted the accusations, but Blanchard has been in hot water back in 2019 for liking biphobic tweets. Cravalio captioned the clip, she's still biphobic, but this movie is going to be so cute and queer. One user commented, crying because that's literally your coworker. And she replied, I was also crying. Blanchard responded in 2019 to the accusations then by saying, I'm queer as fuck. My boyfriend is a trans man and honestly, none of you guys know shit about my private life, but there hasn't been any comments about the TikTok from either actor since. I guess we'll wait and see what happens on the press tour. What if? By now, we're all used to movie adaptations of novels, comic books, plays, and even online articles. But what if 
takes it up a notch because this film is an adaptation of a Reddit thread. Okay, so back in 2018, a 17-year-old boy made a post looking for advice on asking out a trans classmate. He was afraid of social suicide, but was overwhelmed by his romantic feelings for this girl. The original post has been deleted, but there was a bit of news coverage at the time, so you can kind of go back and read the quotes from there. So in the original post, he wrote, I can't even begin to explain how absolutely and painfully beautiful this girl is. If I were a cartoon, my eyes would turn into hearts and leap from their sockets whenever I see her. She makes me feel weak in the knees. The butterflies in my belly get aggressive and many. I could write poetry about this woman. So unsurprisingly, the post quickly went viral as people encouraged the original poster to ask the girl out, offering advice on everything from dealing with social stigma to whether or not he should send her flowers. If you've heard about this thread before, then you probably know how this movie is going to end, but for those who haven't, I won't spoil it, don't worry. So we know that Billy Porter will be directing this film adaptation of a Reddit post with Eva Rain starring as the love interest. I just know that this movie is going to be absolutely up my street. And I think that if they keep the age ranges of the original poster, like having them be high schoolers, this could be a really lovely new like LGBT movie that can be recommended for teenagers, which I'm always really excited about. I think it's especially exciting because we don't really have too many movies like that that we can recommend to young people that have like trans teen leads, especially not played by trans actors. Whistler Camp. After Fear Street became an unexpected queer hit for me last year, I've been excited for more queer horror to come onto the scene. So Whistler Camp sounds right up my alley, especially coming from iconic horror studio Blumhouse and being described as a queer empowerment story set in a gay conversion camp. Horror is a genre that has long balanced itself between the immediacy of like a visceral scare and the social commentary potential of tapping into our innermost fears on a more systemic level. Race, class, and gender are frequent themes in horror. And while queerness may be more familiar to a lot of horror audiences in the villainous role, it also feels ripe for this hero treatment too. There is literally no information on the plot of this movie right now, except for the conversion camp setting. But I guess with the empowerment angle, it'll be interesting to see if and how they get around the tricky queer tropes like bury your gaze or queer villain tropes. Can we assume that the villain won't be one of the queer characters or that the victims won't be the queer campers or will there be some scares for our queer characters too? Some kind of potential peril? I, I guess we'll have to wait to find out. The last thing Mary saw. So carrying on the queer horror theme, uh, Isabel Furman is starring in another queer movie this year, The Last Thing Mary Saw, which is a period horror about oppression, desire and religion in the mid 1800s. A family who has just lost its matriarch gather together to mourn, but when the circumstances of her death are called into question, secrets will be revealed about the forces behind the tragedy. The queerness comes from the forbidden romance between two Puritan girls in the community and that same community's reaction to it. Which uh, I feel like we can safely say won't be good. The critics consensus quote from Rotten Tomatoes is, its restrained approach may frustrate horror fans seeking more visceral thrills, but the last thing Mary saw tells a haunting period tale. This is nearly exactly the Rotten Tomatoes critics consensus on one of my most underrated horror movies of all time, The Little Stranger. So um, I feel like I at least I'm going to very much enjoy this one. Okay, so I stopped filming for a second so I could go and check if the little stranger like consensus had changed. No, it's basically the same. The little stranger's reliance on atmosphere may satisfy audiences in the mood for sophisticated horror fare while frustrating those seeking more visceral thrills. Like essentially the same consensus. Um which seems to be criticizing it for not being a different film, which seems like a strange criticism. So, yeah, I'm excited for this one. Am I okay? If you're the kind of person who watches my channel, then you may well be familiar with the iconic wives slash creative team of Tig Notaro and Stephanie Lynn. Like, I feel like there's a bit of demographic crossover there. Notaro has a prolific stand-up comedy career and she and Lynn created and starred in One Mississippi, a semi-autobiographical show where they played versions of themselves. The show was both hilarious and extremely moving in its depiction of grief, family, and queer romance. One aspect of One Mississippi I know a lot of people wrestle 
fascinated with was the fact that Stephanie's character Kate identifies as straight until she meets Tig. It's not uncommon as an experience for queer women to realize their queerness well into adulthood, which is why I am so excited for Tig and Stephanie's latest project, Am I Okay?, about best friends Jane and Lucy. They are super close and that closeness is challenged when Jane decides to move to London for work and Lucy confesses that she's attracted to women. It sounds like it's going to be like a slow burn kind of friends to lovers long distance romance and I cannot wait for the inevitable like declaration of love at the airport moment. Honestly you can feel the chemistry from the release stills of the movie between the leading ladies uh, like look at these cute in denial lesbians being in love. Framing Agnes. So Framing Agnes is said to be a really interesting movie. Um, it's another one that's at flair and it is like at the top of my list. Um, it blurs the line between fiction and documentary by having trans actors recreate interviews from never before seen case files of gender non-conforming people in the 1950s. The film's website describes the movie as vividly rendered, impeccably vintage reenactments, bringing to life groundbreaking artifacts of trans healthcare. The movie focuses on Agnes, an anonymous trans woman who participated in a famous 1960s study and has since become a controversial figure in trans history. Alongside her story, five others are also going to be told through the movie. It sounds like the filmmakers were keen to expand ideas of trans narratives and community beyond the scope of single exceptional individuals and instead give a voice to the varied experiences both then and now. The documentary portrays the reenactments themselves but also the actors talking about their own experiences and their own opinions about the study and those that participated in it. My Fake Boyfriend. So My Fake Boyfriend is all about, you guessed it, a fake boyfriend. <laughs> this upcoming rom-com stars Keenan Lonsdale as a young man in a tricky situation who follows the advice of his unconventional best friend and uses social media to create a fake boyfriend to keep his awful ex-lover out of his life. But then he meets someone who just might be the right one for him after all. Just like the most classic romance story plotline. The film also stars Dylan Sprouse as Lonsdale's best friend and Sarah Hyland as an as yet unnamed character. You might recognize Lonsdale as the love interest in Love, Simon, a movie that I have some opinions about, uh, but I'm really looking forward to seeing him play a leading man in a queer rom-com that appears to, you know, not be about traumatic coming out or families rejecting you. The movie is also being co-produced by BuzzFeed, which is honestly fascinating to me, but also kind of cool. Like I feel like they've long been a producer of very queer content. You know, it doesn't seem out of nowhere for them to tell this kind of story when they branched out into long form content. The movie is supposed to be out in time for Pride 2022. So I am crossing my fingers for a cute tropey romance with a happy ending. Like I feel like with this kind of premise, it would, it would feel like a betrayal if it wasn't, but Look, I've been burned before. I'm just, I'm trying to be hopeful, but I am just a jaded lesbian who has seen too many queer movies end in tragedy unexpectedly, okay? Like, I'm not gonna make promises to you that I cannot keep. My Policeman. My Policeman is going to put the drama in period drama. It is a film adaptation of a novel which is heavily inspired by a real life relationship. It's set in Brighton in the 1950s. The story following a love triangle of sorts between policeman Tom, played by Harry Styles, school teacher Marion, played by Emma Corrin, and museum curator Patrick, played by David Dawson. The film has both queer representation behind the camera with an openly gay director and screenwriter, as well as in front of the camera with with Emma Corrin who came out publicly in 2021. And Harry Styles has, I mean, a very large queer fan base. I can already see the gift sets already, like from when that trailer drops, they're gonna be everywhere. Without too many spoilers, the book My Policeman doesn't end um, happily. So if you're looking for a straightforward queer romance, maybe give this one a miss, but it does explore the complexities of queer oppression in a compelling way. The book is set in Brighton, which is basically the queer capital of the UK. Like for my American viewers, think San Francisco vibes. Like it's a place associated with queer liberation, but it's queer characters are trapped there. Tom is an enforcer of the law, but the law prevents him from being with the person that he truly loves. We've had queer book to movie adaptations change the ending to be more sad before. So you never know, maybe this one will do the reverse and make it happier, but um, I probably wouldn't live in hope. Firebird. 
So here we have another romantic war drama. I feel like we've had quite a few wartime stories on this list, which is really exciting for me. I made a video a few years ago about the trend of war movies to be a kind of very limited in their scope and be focused solely on straight white cis men. And I'm interested in movies that explore the varied and complex experiences of war outside of just that narrow view. So this movie, I think had its premiere at Flair last year, but it's now gearing up for a more general release. So it is based on a memoir set in the Soviet Air Force during the Cold War and follows the romance between a fighter pilot and a private. The private is longing for his military service to be over, but the arrival of a charismatic fighter pilot at the base changes everything. A love triangle begins between the two men and the secretary of the base commander and the tension both within and outside of their relationship starts to reach boiling point as a KGB investigation surrounds them. Rengi. So this Kiwi flick was made back pre-pandemic but is only just getting its full release this year. It follows the story of trans activist Kaz Davis who returns to his remote politically divided home community after skipping town a decade ago. Kaz has since found his own queer found family in Auckland but is hoping to reconnect with his estranged father even though they haven't seen each other since before Kaz transitioned. Since he left Kaz has missed a lot including his mother's passing and funeral and it's not just his parents he left behind. His ex-boyfriend and his best friend are also still hurt by his sudden and unexpected departure. Alongside the story of homecoming, there's also a hint of romance in the write-ups of the movie, with Kaz's ex-boyfriend experiencing feelings for Kaz, which he has to figure out, like, are these leftover feelings for who Kaz used to be, or am I attracted to Kaz as the man he is today? All of the trans characters in the film are portrayed by trans actors, which is hopefully becoming the norm in media. Although the project was initially set to be a short web series, I think it's been made into a feature film, hopefully allowing it to get kind of a wider, more high profile distribution. Again, this is another one that has come to flair this year and another one that I am very excited to be watching. Great Freedom. So this Austrian drama is another movie set to be a tearjerker. It shines a light on one of the post-Nazi injustices in Germany, paragraph 175, which saw those persecuted by the Nazis as homosexuals remain in prison after the concentration camps had been liberated. In fact, the law was enforced after 1945, sometimes with the use of sting operations, to convict up to 50,000 gay men in West Germany all the way up to the mid-90s. I have been sent a screener of this movie um like I have a copy of this movie in my inbox but I haven't watched it yet because I know it's gonna absolutely break me it looks incredible but yeah I need to be emotionally prepared for this movie so the movie itself takes place in a kind of non-linear narrative across three timelines our lead Hans is repeatedly imprisoned under the law being sent straight from a concentration camp to prison, and the movie spans across the years as he develops a close relationship with his recurring cellmate Victor. Although initially outright homophobic, their relationship begins to deepen, even knowing Victor's own criminal history means that he will be in prison for life. Reviewers thus far have praised its sensitivity without descending into the sentimental, with more than one review saying that everything from the cinematography to the score really emphasizes this feeling of like loneliness and isolation that's present in the prison system and the narrative of the movie itself. Altogether, it seems to be a beautifully made film, just, you know, one that maybe the more emotionally sensitive among us may need to prepare ourselves for. Minyan. This queer coming of age movie is another one based on a short story. It's set in the 1980s, following a 17 year old gay boy raised by a Russian Jewish family in Brooklyn and the friendship he develops with his grandfather's elderly closeted gay neighbors. Outside of his overbearing family home, he starts to explore his sexuality at bars and with hookups, but the specter of the AIDS crisis looms on the horizon. The film has been praised for its portrayal of intergenerational friendship, its tender and stifled protagonist's journey of rebellion, and and exploring the intersections of immigrant, Jewish, and queer identities. So that was uh, a lot of movies to be looking forward to this year. And um, please, please let me know in the comments the ones that you are most excited for, or if there are any movies that I missed. And thanks once more to glassesusa.com for sponsoring this video. For 65% off your first pair, check the link in the description. And as always, if you would like to help support my work, I will leave a link to my Patreon along with all my social media so you can find me all over the internet. And until I see you next time, bye.